All right. Wow. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm Julian Kasper, by the way. I'm a 3D artist, character artist at the Blender Studio. And uh, finally, I get to do another little sculpting live session. It's been actually a while. So um, I uh, actually did this. Uh, this is now actually the second time. So I have a little bit of a track record for sculpting monkeys. Uh, so this was like the redesign for the Susanna Awards, which was a lot of fun. Uh, some of you might remember still the original. Um, and also uh, this, which was like, again, Suzanne, usually it's Suzanne. And uh, at 2019, I did another sculpting talk where I was presenting some of the new features and doing it a bit of a speed sculpting session. So can I do an entire sculpt in an hour? Um, this time it's gonna be a bit more relaxed. I'm not gonna try to finish an entire thing in an hour. Instead, I'm giving a bit more of a, a guided tour of some of the milestones and highlights of um, what uh, monkey I <laughs> sculpted this time. Um, but uh, yeah, this uh, is 3D, by the way. Like, I can just move around. I'm using Eevee to visualize this. And uh, did used a bunch of new features, not all of them necessarily new. There's a lot of features that came out in the last four years since 2019, where I did the last uh, presentation. Uh, but this is using like, just regular mesh sculpting modifiers, uh, presenting at Eevee, but also uh, some new additions like hair sculpting, which is really cool to play around with to do these hair clumps. Um, and yeah, uh, I can cancel out of this. This is uh, based on a concept painting from Vivian Lukowski, uh, our in-house concept artist. Uh, which is super nice. And I wanted to see how close I can get to this while doing it a little bit more stylized, a bit more simplified. Um, but yeah, uh, let's just get to it. Um, I have another file open over here. Perfect. So um, essentially, <laughs> what I started with is uh, a base mesh. Uh, for the past like two years, I've been like uh, talking with people and trying to collect together a human base mesh bundle that people can use to speed up their sculpting workflow a bit. Uh, this actually gets soon a bit more additions. There's a bunch of new stuff that has been worked on. There's like the stylized and the realistic characters from before, but also primitive mesh meshes, which I'm gonna use this time around. But then also like other stuff like a full skeleton and uh, muscular model. I'm really excited for that to actually land in there. Um, but I actually really like starting uh, sculpting with these base meshes if I want to have it be not too loose. Um, because uh, let's just. Um, so uh, also, by the way, split uh, editors. I love just having concept art over here on the side. But what I also like to do is just to have a camera view on the side where I can switch a uh, reference on and off, which is actually, wait, can you hear me? OK. Uh, OK, there, there was supposed to be a background image uh, loaded here, but it's not working. Usually, hold on, maybe I can fix this. Oops. Ah. Doesn't matter too much. OK. No? OK. So um, first things that are nice to do is just like basically getting this into pose. Each of these are different objects, which makes it really easy to just like put it roughly in a pose. Um, the nice things about these base meshes, what I usually try to do is to keep the uh, symmetrical objects uh, have them use the same object data. So if I'm already starting to sculpt on these objects, the changes permeate to the other side, uh, which saves a bunch of time. But the really nice thing is then I can already start to pose a fully asymmetrical uh, pose that, that tries to match the concept a bit more. Um, and yeah, let's see. So, um, but there's a, a couple tricks to this because uh, just keeping this uh, roughly symmetrical with separate objects can be sometimes a bit tricky. Like um, 
sometimes like I would like rotate the the eyes in different directions. Um, but how do I keep this then symmetrical? And there's actually a nice little new feature called uh, parent transform orientation. And actually then he starts using the transform orientation of the direct parent, which in this case is the head. So I can just use both of the, uh, select both of these and move them and they stay symmetrical, uh, which is super nice. Uh, but the tricky thing here is then, what if I want to move them inwards or outwards? Uh, and in that case, there's actually a little feature here that says effect only locations. So in that case, if I scale them along the x-axis, they actually move. So only the actual locations are being transformed, which again, helps to keep this all a bit more symmetrical. Um, you can set shortcuts to these if you use them often. I actually made my own Pi menu to just have them directly in the pivot point Pi menu. Um, but basically, uh, I'm going just like through this and roughly pose it into like a monkey-shaped human. Um, some extra objects can be easily added to already block out the major volumes. Like uh, I added like just a sphere in the middle of the head and moved this around and remeshed it a bunch of times. Uh, in this case, it's uh, it just like with pressing R to define a resolution and then control R to remesh. And just like trying to roughly block out every major object, everything that makes up this character, uh, even if it's not totally accurate, it helps to just like um, to uh, figure out some problems with the pose, because usually there's some interpretation that needs to happen when translating the 2D image to the 3D pose and some compromises. Um, but I'm basically just like jumping from object to object on these uh, to, to sculpt these. And there's also a nice feature that is at this point already a bit old, but it's a bit hidden, uh, which is uh, to, you don't need to go into object mode, select another object, go into sculpt mode, and go back into object mode, another, select another thing, go into sculpt mode. There's a handy shortcut on Alt Q. You can remap to some, that to something else if you like, uh, to just immediately switch to another object. Uh, I do this all the time. I don't know how to live without this anymore. Uh, it gives you this handy little uh, flash uh, overlay to just let you know which, which object you switch to. And if you want to be really sure to know which object you're on right now, there's even an overlay to fade all the other objects a bit more into the viewport background color, which gives you a constant reminder of which object you're on. Uh, although I use this not too much. Um, right. Um, the other thing that's really nice to already do at this point is just to slap some basic colors on it. And at some point, uh, painting functionality, functionality got added to sculpt mode. So there's paint brushes directly here, and you can just start painting the object however you want, if I'm on the correct object, that is. <laughs> um, exactly. So um, the shortcuts got a bit updated recently, so you can just uh, sample colors with Shift X which used to be on S, and uh, flip the colors with X, which is now generally supported in every mode, as far as I know. And uh, if you're in something like vertex paint mode, you can press Control X to fill the color. Um, so all of that is kind of tied to X because deleting doesn't really, isn't really a concept in painting modes, so that shortcut is generally free. But yeah, so we basically keep going until we have these major shapes in place. And from that point on, um, we can go more into detail uh, to get it closer to the concept. And since there was this whole setup of just like uh, linking the object data and parenting a bunch of stuff, there needs to be a bit of cleanup to make that easier. Uh, the first thing that I generally do is because I scale these objects uh, a lot, is to just select everything and control A and apply scale which in this case doesn't work yet. Uh, we need to, uh, the objects are still having the object data linked. Um, you could press on this two button in the object data uh, over here, which is a bit tedious. There's a single 
um, menu operation here that does that for us. And that's it's a bit in a nested menu, but it's called make single user. I use this a lot. I, I have a shortcut tied to this. But if you say object and object data, then all of these are individual objects again, and you can sculpt them however you want, which also means we can apply the scale on all of them. And that should work now too. Uh, on some of these objects, there's going to be the issue that now, because they had a negative scale, the normals are flipped. In that case, you can just go into edit mode, select everything, and shift N, and it will correct the normals, and it's done. Uh, this should be pinned. There we go. Um, and now it's basically ready for sculpting. Um, the nice thing now is to just join a bunch of these objects together with Control J. You can go into sculpt mode and immediately remesh it with the voxel remesher, which gets rid of the intersections. There's one thing that I forgot about. They actually have also modifiers. Um, I generally like to also do that with a Control A shortcut. There's something called visual geometry to mesh which is just uh, a very handy way of applying everything onto the geometry. It just gets rid of all the, uh, all the modifiers, shape keys, and just like uh, cleans the mesh up, and then it's, uh, it's ready to sculpt on more. So I can control R. Um, there are some extra settings. I forgot to turn them on. They are enabled by default to uh, preserve the vertex colors as well. So if you remesh, all of those stick around. And from that point on, we can sculpt a bit further. There's one thing that typically happens, and I can uh, showcase that a bit easier, if I, for example, didn't have the resolution so high on the subdivision surface modifier. That is, if you remesh on a higher resolution than you're, you were typically on, then we're going to run into this issue that everything is a bit jagged. It's, it doesn't smooth it automatically. You could go over here and just like smooth everything with a smooth brush, but you're likely going to miss a few areas. Um, for a while, there was already uh, the concept of filters, which are these handy tools over here, and they just apply an operation on the entire mesh, anything that is not masked. So you just click and drag. And based on how much you click and drag, how far you drag, it's going to smooth the mesh or inflate it or whatever. Um, but this is also, since recently, uh, available just as menu operators, which makes it easier to uh, assign shortcuts to them or add them to uh, custom menus or the quick favorites menu. And you just click on one of these, click and drag, and then you can smooth it. You even get like the little pop-up over here to adjust the operation a bit more afterwards. So it's a bit more consistent with how other modes in Blender work. Um, you can even, um, like if I would uh, click create a mask over here and I want to smooth the mask, there's a lot of like mask-related operations on the, uh, on the Pi menu on the shortcut A. Um, and one of, like the typical one that I just use is smooth mask. And you, at some point, you just used to just like do this, like constantly A down, A down. But uh, now you just can do it once, and you can just increase the amount down here, uh, or uh, you can, with like just any operation that you do in uh, any mode, you can press Shift R to just or hold Shift R to just keep repeating the same operation. So that will uh, make that a bit faster. Um, right, so another thing that is kind of handy, and I want to get into that, is um, getting a bit more, like a bit easier control over your visibility and your masks. So let's say I joined all of these objects. They are all separate geometry for now. And uh, let's, let's see. Uh, by the way, I have some custom menus in here, but uh, basically I just adjusted the uh, face sets overlay because we're going to use those now. Uh, all of these are like separate geometries, and if you want to use face sets, which the usefulness of them I can, I'm going to go get into in a moment, uh, you can very quickly set them up um, on your mesh with uh, these options over here. It's called initialize face sets. 
And uh, like the most typical one that you're gonna use probably 95% of the time is by loose parts. So every mesh that is not connected will get a different face set immediately. That already saves a bunch of time. And the most typical use for face sets is it uh, helps with, vi uh, with hiding meshes. It's basically like a selection set. So you can point at any of these face sets and hide them. Uh, in this case, this is with the shortcut H. Uh, the shortcuts got uh, updated for the latest version a little bit to make them a bit more consistent with the rest of Blender. So H is for hiding, and Shift H is for isolating a, a face set. Um, but you can also hide a few of them. Let's say, for example, I want to get the entire uh, foot. I can hide this, and then with the face set high menu on Alt W, I can invert the selection and get all of this. Um, so that's just really nice for uh, isolating parts of your mesh. Um, and let's say I'm just gonna remesh all of this. So with R, I'm gonna define a resolution. Let's go a bit high and Control R. Oh, forgot this again. Um, it's actually a little handy trick and it's is not obvious at all. This should be uh, made more obvious. And that is, uh, if you want to uh, have these toggles switched on all of your objects, ideally all the objects that you have selected, you select all of them, you go into sculpt mode, and there is the typical concept of holding alt and then it will toggle it on every object that is selected. And this also counts for these toggles. So. Uh, you, I can hold Alt, toggle all of them, and now these toggles will be enabled on all of the objects. So now I can go back in here and Control R. I can also smooth this a little bit. Now, the typical thing that we also want to have a bit more control over is uh, uh, basically masking or selecting parts. And the most typical ways of doing that is with a mask brush or with the uh, lasso masking. Um, but how do you reliably mask face sets? And I, one way that I saw a lot of people do it online is uh, they just like hide certain face sets and then just uh, basically flood fill the mask and then unhide everything else. And that's a reliable way of doing it. Uh, but there's another way. Uh, and that is basically with the feature called expand. So if you use shift A, you can expand a mask out of a starting point. So you define the start point and the end point, and it will follow along the geodesic distances of the mesh. So it, like, uh, it takes the actual distances along the faces. Um, but there's a bunch of handy shortcuts in here. So you can, uh, the typical one that is really handy is you can hold control to snap it to face sets. So you can just press Shift A, and snap to these face sets and all of them are immediately masked. Uh, the same goes, for example, with the foot and all of the toes. So if I go in here and I expand a mask outwards from here, the neat little thing is because all of the toes are already fully encapsulated by the expansion, if I hold control to snap, it will snap all of these automatically as well. And the extra little feature on top is if you use any of the transform tools, like if I want to rotate, I can uh, basically, I can uh, expand a mask, snap it to here, and it will set the pivot point automatically at the border of the mask. So I can smooth this a little bit with the API menu, repeat it, and then, well, rotate the rest of the body. <laughs> Invert the mask that's also on the API menu, and then I can rotate this foot. Um, basically like that. There's another little shortcut that I assigned. It's not by default, but there is an operator here to in sculpt. It's hide masked. And I just set that to control H and that's really handy in a combination with uh, this snapping to face sets. So I can just mask the entire foot, control H and it's hidden. Um, basically like that. And that's, that's just like little features that speed up the workflow for masking and hiding certain parts. And then from there on out, uh, we can basically just keep working on this. And the reason why, like in this case, for example, this is so handy is uh, in the case of me as at some point just having 
merged all of these objects. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the way. Like you can uh, isolate the part with uh, with the what is that? Like a backslash key uh, to use local view. Uh, but the oh, in this case, this got merged. I, that that shouldn't have happened. Um, uh, but for example, if one of the arms or foot is kind of in the way or it gets sampled in the brush as well, like in this case, if I want to sculpt this, um, the annoying thing can sometimes be that the geometry of the leg is actually taken into account by the brush and it distorts a bit the direction of the brush. A very easy thing to prevent that is just to hide that part of the geometry and then the brush will no longer take that geometry into account. Uh, like if you would have, for example, a bunch of fingers side by side, that can be really helpful. So if I have these over here and I want to sculpt on them, uh, it will just keep messing with this. And even if it's fully masked off, it will just keep using this geometry as well and do weird things. So if I just uh, create face sets by loose parts and hide these fingers, then the brushes will have a bit of a better behavior for only this finger. Oops. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, and then from there, I'm basically just polishing this further. This ear over here, that was just like a plane that I uh, used. I gave it a solidify modifier and uh, some subdivisions, and that's it. Um, the nice thing here, um, the, it can be sometimes a bit difficult to sculpt on a geometry that has back faces directly behind it because it will start to merge these together. This is the like really common issue that uh, it's very easy to run into. And with that, face sets can also really help. So I could, for example, go in here, just uh, mark this loop here as a seam. Actually, let me isolate this object with local view and place a seam over here as well. And I can, in sculpt mode, initialize face sets by UV seams. And now both of these sides are instantly getting a face set. And now it's very easy to just mask off this part, this entire face set, and sculpt on this without worries that it will affect the other side. Um, exactly. From there on out, like I'm basically just like polishing this further and skipping ahead a little bit into something that is a bit more, still a bit rough, but it's getting closer to this concept. All of the uh, elements are sort of getting into place, uh, even if they're just like temp placeholders, like these little, these basically fur objects over here. Uh, they are not meant to be. The, the object that I'm doing the final sculpt on, but they help to just pre-visualize the sculpt a bit further. Um, exactly. Hold on, I'm gonna grab a bit of water. At this point, I'm basically just, uh, I'm having the second viewport, uh, viewport over here, and I'm just uh, constantly referencing the concept art that is not showing up as a background image. Not sure, oh, ah, I think I know why. I'm not on the correct camera. There we go. Uh, so this was the camera that I set up at the beginning and then I have the background image set up over here. And I'm basically just toggling overlays on and off to compare and it's slightly transparent so I can still see where roughly the objects are I'm trying to match it sort of as close as possible to this while working in this viewport to make it kind of three-dimensionally sound. Um, another helpful little feature that got expanded more in recent releases is auto-masking. And this is having like a little panel over here in the header. And this saves a lot of time when it comes to setting up, uh, instead of like setting up your own masks, you can have that happen automatically. So in the case, for example, of this ear, um, which used to have face sets. Okay, let me set that up again real quick. So 
face sets by UV seams. There we go. Instead of just like masking this part off so it doesn't affect, isn't affected by this anymore, you can enable auto masking by face sets. And then the face set that you first clicked on while using a, uh, a tool, an operator, a brush, it will only affect that single face set, which makes it then super easy and fast to use. There's a shortcut for this, Alt A, and I'm toggling things here like all the time. Um, the other useful thing is, for example, if I'm sculpting on this thing, um, I can sculpt this, but these are separate meshes. I want to affect them separately for now, sculpt them a bit more into detail before merging them properly. In that case, you just auto mask by topology with Alt A and all of your brushes will automatically detect the geometry that you clicked on first and only sculpt on that. Uh, there's a bunch of more options in here and I can really recommend to try them out. Uh, I'm gonna go into them a bit later, or at least one of them. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to really get into, let's see, um, is there's a few other handy features. So um, the grab brush is pretty straightforward and I love to just use the grab brush with topology auto masking all the time. But there's another handy little feature and that can really help in two specific cases. So let's say I want to I have this hand and I want to uh, make the fingers wider. Well, first thing I can do is auto mask by topology and it will only grab one of the fingers, uh, but it's like keeps dr dragging everything that's in the brush radius. Um, you can enable this option over here called grab silhouette, and then it will only grab the silhouette of the mesh that you're, point, uh, that you're clicking on. Um, if it still grabs like a bit of the other finger, you can also mask that off, shift A, control to snap to those face sets, and it's immediately masked. Same thing over here, control, snap to face sets, and that's masked. And that really helps with like fine tuning the silhouette and the shape a bit more. Uh, I actually have uh, multiple uh, grab brushes that I'm cycling between. So there's this neat little feature that if you press the shortcut mm -hmm. for one, or one specific type of a brush, like a grab brush, which is G, multiple times, it will cycle through all of the grab brushes that you have in your file. In this case, I have three ones, like a regular grab brush. I have the grab silhouette brush, which I actually made green. You can customize the color as well. That just makes it really easy to tell them apart when you're cycling. And the other one is a grab 2D brush. And that's basically just a grab brush with a projected fall off. I use this all the time. This is, uh, instead of grabbing everything that is within the spherical brush radius over here, you can grab everything infinitely in depth. And this can really be handy to get some extra control over your shapes. And if you want to make some changes that cascade over like the entire shoulder. You can just quickly do that with this brush. Um, in this case over here, the hands, I replaced them at some point with another base mesh to get like a bit more of a clean topology for the fingers. And with another really great um, additional feature for this case is all of these finger joints have uh, their own face set. And if you use the pose brush over here, it has like a setting that you can set. By default, it's just like, uh, it's basically checking from the start point, what is the sort of the boundary um, away from that on the brush radius. And you can then, uh, it sets a pivot point there and you can rotate the hand. But that can be a bit loose. It can be a bit ambiguous where it places that pivot point. If you want to be exact, you set this uh, the setting to face sets, and then it becomes really easy to pose these fingers. So I can just go in here, and I don't need to set up masks to first try to pose this into, to make a selection and then get a pivot point. Uh, it's a bit wonky now because I already posed this before. Um, but you can just very quickly pose these fingers, and you don't need to interact with the transform tools which is an option, but it's just a bunch of more clicks to do this. 
uh, it can give you a bit more extra control. So I could just like mask off all of this and it places the pivot point over here. And let's say it's just like place the pivot point a bit at the wrong spot. You can use uh, shift right click to uh, set the pivot point at a slightly different location on the surface, um, which then gives a bit of extra control. So it's the same shortcut as setting the, the 3D cursor. Um, and then you can just keep working with that. Um, exactly. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I can really recommend to play around with expand in general. There's a lot of things that you can do with it. Um, they, it also exists for face sets, so you don't just have to, uh, you cannot just make a mask. It's also like, for example, over here on the eye, if I use shift W instead of, instead of shift A, I can expand a face set for the iris and then do it again for the pupil. But let's say, for example, I, uh, uh, if I clear the face sets, uh, if I first made one for the pupil and then do one for the iris, I can actually press E to preserve the previous face sets and then it will just uh, basically create new face sets for everywhere where the overlap is with the expansion. Um, there's a bunch of, like for in this case, I placed it at the wrong point. I can even hold spacebar to reposition the expansion to somewhere else. So there's a bunch of neat little tricks in there. I can actually recommend to just, uh, I there was a bit of an effort to clean up uh, the manual and make it a bit more uh, helpful. So there's like new pages on the Blender manual to read up on like how this tool works. There's a bunch of, uh, like all of the options are essentially explained and what you can do with it, like for pattern creation, creating comp more complex geometry, and that's all just using Expand. Even like uh, when Pablo Dobaro introduced this feature, he made a live stream and it's just linked right here because it shows some really nice use cases. Um, but yes, in this case, I have the face sets uh, set up and this can actually be really useful for painting as well. So I have the... Uh, Let's just uh, subdivide this a bunch of times actually. So I have a bunch of, uh, let's say I didn't paint this before. And I typically also just disable the face sets. If I already know where I created them, they don't uh, bother me. They can sometimes falsify the color information that you need while painting. So just turn them off, that's fine. And in this case, I can like, go over here, pick this color, and I can auto mask by face set and just paint this in and then pick a black color, paint this in over here. And uh, yeah, it's basically all immediately filled in these parts. Right. Let's see. So I'm going to jump ahead one more time. So at, oop. OK, that crashed. I don't think I'm on the latest version over here. <laughs> Perfect, okay, so, so basically all of these uh, objects, I would merge them, uh, refine them a bit more, and just start sculpting more of these, let's see, um, these objects a bit more into detail to get it closer to the concept. But this can now also present some interesting opportunities for vertex painting, because there's another type of auto masking that I really love. And let's say I'm just like painting over all of this. Um, and that is that if I just quickly grab this color, uh, I can auto mask by cavity. So cavity masks are something that were lacking in Blender for a while. And you can make just a regular cavity mask. You can just go in here and say mask by cavity and it will create a mask. It's not that visible right now because the mask is a bit, the overlay is not that uh, strong. But then you get some extra options. You can uh, blur the mask further. You can uh, get the inverted mask, or you can even set a custom curve to get some extra control. In this case, let's just make it full screen so it's not blocking. Um, so you can customize this, and then you can use this for sculpting or painting. But Typically, while like just filling in a bit of color in the crevices or the valleys, it's not that complex of a mask that's needed. So you can also just enable auto masking by cavity 
and it will automatically create a mask for you. So if I now would start uh, painting over here, like cavity inverted would use the, the uh, would mask everything except the crevices, it will start just automatically masking all the crevices. And then cavity would do the inverse. So I can just have a quick pass of color over this, just get like all the pores and wrinkles would be very quickly filled with the color. And if you need to tweak this further, you get the same settings over here as with making a custom mask. So you can just go in here, set a custom curve, blur it further. It doesn't give you like a, a preview as you're doing this, but it's uh, uh, in the worst case, you can also just say, I want to create a mask from this and then it will create a mask. You can see how that auto mask would look like and clear it again or you keep using that mask. But the auto masks are generally something very quick to use and not in the way. It's very invisible. Exactly. So that's how, how I would sculpt more on this uh, and paint the surfaces. Uh, generally, what I also like to do is uh, at some point switch to uh, Eevee as well, which is really handy. So the performance impact in Eevee is very minimal unless you add a bunch of lights. Uh, so you can also just keep sculpting directly. Oops, I have auto masking enabled. Um, so you can keep sculpting with Eevee lighting. Uh, in this case, the <laughs> Metcap, uh, the, the HDRI is kind of not ideal, but this can really help if you're already starting to set up some materials, you want to previous your objects, and you want to sculpt on it at the same time. It just gives you that real-time environment to work with this. Um, exactly. But while painting in the viewport, that's also very easy. And I can actually recommend to switch from the matcaps to the studio lighting setup. There's one specific one that is very specifically made for painting. It makes it all very evenly lit, very bright, close to white, and gives you just enough shape information to still read the model properly. Exactly. Um, from there, let's see. I actually had all of those fur objects, and this was actually quite fun. I wanted to, in that's also why I picked this concept, something that has fur. I wanted to experiment with something that also got added to the whole sculpt mode ecosystem, and that is curves, the new curves that uh, are used for grooming. Because if I go in here, this is actually a bunch of curves that are using geometry nodes to generate geometry on these. So this is the current feature set for curve sculpting is still very much optimized or like pivoted towards like generating and interpolating a lot of hair curves. Um, but you can't, since it is geometry nodes, you can just basically do with it whatever you want. And in this case, I just did the typical workflow of having, uh, let's see, like having a, another curve somewhere else that defines a profile and using that on this object to generate these uh, curves with thickness. This is like, Typically, you would set this up with a regular curve object, like you would add a Bezier curve and the define a profile and a thickness in there. But you would have to do that like basically curve by curve. Or when you have all of those curves in one object, it becomes quite difficult to manage to edit them. In this case, I can just go into sculpt mode and start grooming these curves into position. And I can go in edit mode and select these curves specifically and then groom those into place and have I, even like a bunch of other brushes to lengthen them a little bit or uh, shrink them and smooth them out, basically just like sculpting features in general. Um, there's still a couple of limitations with this, like being able to properly see the orig original uh, curves underneath, like if I would uh, set x-ray a bit lower, I can see them. But those are just like some, uh, some little issues that are still need to be ironed out. Um, the thing that these curves need, though, is an emitter object to spawn from. And in that case, I just grabbed this entire body object 
and used the QuadriFlow remesher, which is quite basic it uh, can't sometimes it can't handle complex geometry very well but if you just like oh, okay so i would duplicate this i would ideally remesh it another time with a voxel remesher ideally with this little option over here to make it a bit cleaner and there we go and that can then be a base to use quadriflow and remesh this just takes a second and it's not the best topology, especially like to sculpt on. It sometimes has some uh, weird issues. But for something like make, creating a very quick emitter for hair sculpting, it does the job. And then you can just basically go in here, uh, either make automatic UV, an automatic UV map or place some seams manually uh, in case you're picky. And then it should all be ready to be used. So you would basically just select this object, add curve, and then empty hair, and you would already be able to go in here, use this brush, for example, to set the dens density, and you can start adding curves to it and comb them into place. Um, I'm not gonna go into the geometry nodes setup too much, because the, it's, it's really messy. <laughs> um, but there's one little, um, uh, limitation that there's there, there are attributes like tilt and radius for these curves but it's not that easy to edit them at the moment so what you can do is you can plug these attributes into your geometry nodes network to add those attributes to them so I have radius and tilt and what I would do is I would either use the selection brush in sculpt mode or go into edit mode to like select a bunch of curves and you can select the, the attribute you want to edit. And there is a set attribute um, operator. I typically have a, uh, a shortcut assigned to that, Shift E. And then you can set, change the radius for that. And I also have another attribute over here for tilt. And then you can change the tilt. So if I would go in here and sculpt these curves, I'm just going to delete them real quick. So as I'm starting, I'm going to add the radius and I'm going to add the tilt. Oops, caps lock. That's not right. That's, that's it. Um, I would go in with the density brush, just add a bunch of curves. I can already select all of them and just like groom them sort of into place. Um, and then if I want to um, tweak them further, I can tweak the, the radius, make them a bit thicker, or the tilt, if I want to tilt them more towards the camera or uh, more towards the silhouette of the object. And then if I want to fine tweak them further, I can like go in here, select the specific curve, sculpt it. Um, there's no such thing as like selection sets, like face sets in here. So you can separate these into multiple objects or you can go uh, back into sculpt mode, deselect everything and just add a bunch of new curves and they will be automatically selected. So you can start grooming them into place, tweaking them a bit further and setting the radius, setting the tilt if they're not quite right. In this case, I'm lucky that they are pretty well. Uh, I'm usually going into edit mode, moving these around, which might detach them a bit from the surface. In that case, you can use the snap to nearest surface or snap to deformed surface, which is the original position they were on on the UVs, and they will snap right back. Um, or you could also use the slide brush over here to help to just slide these curves around. Like I can just like, show this a bit easier over here. So they slide around. Uh, if you want to do it on multiple curves at the same time. And that's basically how I <laughs> started populating all of these curves over here. I put a bit more effort here on the face than on the arms, but the nice thing is that you can do some extra shading to just like blend the normals a bit into the mesh uh, and make it look a bit nicer. Uh, or you could even apply the modifiers and make it a mesh and then sculpt on it further. You can do this at the, as the first step to populate the, the character with a bunch of hair uh, clumps and then subdivide and then sculpt them further into detail if they need it. Um, so using the procedural setup just for basically base mesh generation 
which is super nice. Um, but yeah, that's basically just like all the techniques that I use to set up all of these different hair curves and the character at large. Uh, there's another little thing that I did on top of here is I used the real-time compositor to add uh, the Kuahara filter on top to make it a bit more, to get rid of some of the details and make it look a bit more like, almost like painterly, just a bit simplified. Um, but you can enable and disable this, this as you want, but it's super nice to just uh, have compositing live in the viewport as you're doing previous on characters. Um, that's basically it. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of other features that are in development right now that will make all of this even easier. One of the top ones is uh, updating dynamic topology to work better with all of these features. So the first foremost one of that is support face sets, but also like dynamic topology has the tendency to just like destroy your entire topology. So uh, the thing that is being worked on is to, in, to preserve any attribute that you have on the mesh. So if it's UV maps, seams, uh, like your open boundaries, it's generally gonna be better at preserving all of those uh, edges and uh, attributes. And the interesting opportunity that comes in there is that you can actually use this original sculpt as the emitter and just keep working on it with dynamic topology, remeshing the mesh, and the hair curves can still use the original UV map on that mesh to spawn from it. So it makes it all a bit easier. Um, and of course, geometry nodes keeps getting updates. And the really exciting thing there is geometry nodes operators, which can, like if you go into geometry nodes, you have the option to either use uh, it as a modifier or to add basically your own tools powered by geometry nodes. And there's a bunch of things that will be really useful to do that for, for sculpt mode, mesh sculpt mode, for example, for saving your masks and face sets and loading them in later because they can just be stored as attributes to basically make your own filters with use of textures and or even just like to have very quick access for various base mesh generation, just you, you mask a certain part of your, of your mesh and you generate a piece of geometry there based on some geometry nodes logic. So, so there's a bunch of features to look forward to. And I'm basically out of time. But if you want to find out more like uh, about the current features, the manual is a bit more up to date, a bit more cleaned up everything is a bit easier to find. And hopefully I will make a, uh, an article, like a blog post after the Blender conference to just share the files from this, uh, from this talk and give a bit more of a summary and some insight. So um, after this, there's actually a grooming talk. So I will just like sit down to the, into, <laughs> into the audience and just keep watching. Um, but uh, hopefully afterwards I can see you in like the, the, the market or the hacker bar. I'm just gonna sit down there with a laptop and do some sculpting. Maybe if you have some questions, I can see you there. So uh, hopefully see you around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.